Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Ian Williams, president of the Foreign Press Association, uh, with my guests here today, Greg Autry and Bill Holstein. Uh, Greg Autry is um, author of uh, books and a distinguished student of space science and also the Middle Kingdom's role in orbit. Uh, and Greg, uh, Bill Holstein has been studying China, was in China for many years. I don't think he ever got on a Chinese rocket, but uh, he, they would have liked to put him on a rocket afterwards, I suspect. But uh, he spent many years in China and he spent many years um, studying how China takes advantage of Western technology, shall we say, adopts Western technology. How is that for a kind phrase <laughs> to, to, to it? Uh, to what is it? Socialism with Chinese characteristics, oh. as uh, as Mr. as Comrade Xi says. Um, so this is obviously a, a very good time. I don't know whether you notice it's the anniversary near enough of the um, moon landing, the very first moon landing with Apollo eleven. It's also, of course, the weekend after Virgin Tours did its first joyride into the edge of the stratosphere. And um, a lot of people made many comments about, well, the best thing millionaires could do in orbit and staying there being the kindest I'd heard so far. <laughs> but um, the, the, there is a contrast. The, the Chinese have a moon, uh, a Mars, Mars rover flying about. NASA is still sort of to some extent, um, treading water after many years. And we're back to the days of the uh, almost the original space race when Yuri Gagarin going into space gave a jolt to America. And really, it was a Rube Goldberg, eff Rube Goldberg effort to get a man on the moon in time for the President Kennedy's uh, political ambitions. Uh, we're glad that he did. Um, but that, that's what we're now about to talk about. And Greg is going to lead off in this about the, the state of the um, of China in space and what their ambitions are, what the capabilities are and where they're going to go. And then Bill will come in afterwards and we'll discuss uh, to what extent the um, Western technology will be, um, how should we say kindly, co-opted to the Chinese effort, voluntarily or involuntarily. So Greg, please roll. Uh, first, I need to get somebody, if they would, to enable uh, screen sharing for me. Uh, but uh, while somebody figures that out, uh, let me just comment about your 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 note on timing. And this is precipitous. Uh, Branson's flight, uh, Jeff Bezos' flight to space next week, and Elon Musk company SpaceX later this year flying commercial astronauts to orbit really marks a tipping point in space. Uh, after essentially 70 years in space, we're about to see a existential change in the way as if we relate to space, we're seeing a world where real average human beings, albeit a fairly wealthy, are going to be going to space. And then you're going to see the price drop. So let's not worry about millionaires and billionaires in space. Let's think about the fact that uh, someday soon, that could be you and I, I think within five years, we'll see this in the sub $50,000 ticket for, for suborbital space flight. 10 years that this could be a, a few thousand dollars for a suborbital space flight. So uh, the average American there, uh, Brett, will certainly be able to do that, uh, you know, if uh, they're willing to pay a little bit for, for their vacation. It, it, it's an important uh, perspective change, if nothing else. And I was on CNN Sunday commenting on this. And one of the things I like to say is, would you rather these guys be building a new yacht or a mansion or, uh, um, you know, I don't know, going on dates with, uh, uh, with celebrities, or would you rather see them trying to do something that that expands the uh, you know the human domain? Um, and I think they're taking the dates on space trips to impress them at the moment. Greg. There you go. Whatever, whatever works. I'd rather they did it on a rocket because they're developing new technology. They're creating jobs. They're opening up better understandings of our environment and taking a bunch of wealthy people and giving them a new perspective of the Earth and seeing the world with no borders, seeing that thin atmosphere and understanding how fragile our biosphere. That's changed every astronaut that I've ever spoken to, and I've spoken to a lot, and, and it'd be a good thing to, to send a lot of wealthy people to experience that. So with that said, I see my slides are available, so let me share them here real quick. Oops. 
So uh, this uh, title, which I believe you came up with, Ian, referred to the high frontier. And uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, this is a seminal book by Gerard K. O'Neill uh, that inspired me and many other uh, young people back in the 1980s to, uh, to step up uh, and strive for a new future in space. Because O'Neill, like many other folks, realized he was what we call a disappointed children of Apollo. When I was six, I sat there and I saw Buzz and, and Neil Armstrong on the moon. And I was sure uh, that by the time I was 20 or 30, I was going to be doing that too. And of course, it, it didn't come to pass because the government didn't have the incentive or the efficiency to, uh, to open space uh, uh, to us all. And, and O'Neill saw a, a private and commercial future in space where people would live and work in space. And, there would be a functional space economy and we would move industry and extractive technologies like mining and uh, we would move polluting and a large portion of the population off the planet uh creating a better environment here on earth and uh he inspired people like peter damandis who who started the x prize and uh, directly and indirectly uh uh Bezos, Musk, and, and Branson today. Uh, and uh, there's a great new documentary about his life that is worth seeing. Uh, I'd like to point out the space race uh, or age, the space age started in 1942, not 1957, as many people like to think. The first human object uh, uh, launched above 50 miles, which is the real, uh, real limit to space, as Mr. Branson knows. Uh, was a German V-2 rocket launched in 1942, October 3rd. Uh, I can't re resist. There's many a widow in old London town owes her rich pension to Werner von Braun. <laughs> I make them go up, a verse they come down. That's a different department, said Werner von Braun. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist that. <laughs> no problem. And, and that's the point I'm getting to, right? So we, we have alternative futures here. Um, we're have the future where Von Braun hung out with Disney when I was a kid. We saw him on TV talking about the miraculous future we would have in space with uh, unlimited uh, uh, resources, with uh, vast amounts of, uh, of domain to conquer, with power and, and, uh, and a, a, a bold new world we would live in. Uh, then you have the Von Braun from 20 years before that, uh, with his SS uh, minders. Um, and we could have gone either way. Any of you that might watch the, uh, the show Man in the High Castle, you know, that's, that's the future we, we, we could have had, uh, but, but for a hair's breadth. Uh, Von Braun and his team not only had the V2, uh, they had a space plane design that was going to be able to skip off the atmosphere and drop the Nazi nuclear bomb on, on the East Coast of the United States. And uh, if they'd had another five years, uh, they probably would have been able to do that. Uh, other alternative futures, we could have had the Soviet Union in space. And I think nothing speaks more about uh, uh, how authoritarian regimes uh, respond to uh, the success of a free world uh, development than the, uh, the Soviet space shuttle there on the right, which is just frankly indistinguishable from the American space shuttle on the left. Luckily, the Soviets ran out of uh, oomph and money before uh, they managed to expand the, the Soviet view of, uh, of politics and uh, society into uh, our solar system, because I don't personally think that would have been a particularly good thing. And now we've got another alternative future choice between the, the US-led uh, Artemis uh, program, which brings together uh, a number of uh, other nations in an effort to uh, explore and commercially develop the moon. Uh, or the, uh, the Chinese-Russian uh, conglomeration on the moon, which is working to try to bring in international partners. And, you know, there are some countries who will be eager to sign up on that because they'll see, see Chinese money. And this is the scary thing, the difference between what we had to face with uh, the Russians and what we had to face with the Chinese is the Chinese are not going to run out of money. That's one thing that's not going to happen because we keep giving it to them, right? Can you imagine if during the the Soviet Union US space race if we were buying most of our products for the Soviet Union and if Goldman Sachs and uh, venture capitalists on Sand Hill Road in, in uh, Silicon Valley were lining up to throw money at the Soviet Union to help them develop better technology. So that's the, the situation we're in. And, and that's scary because frankly, the, the Chinese political and uh, 
in cultural landscape now is, is much worse than the Soviet Union. So Artemis has uh, 13 nations, as I mentioned, the UK Space Agency, the Japanese Space Agency, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Brazil has recently signed up. The UAE is very excited about this. Uh, and I think we'll see even more nations uh, piling on to that. And this is a set of accords for within the role of the Outer Space Treaty, the international governing law, for these countries to work together in uh, developing the moon sustainably and for commercial purposes. Uh, you can imagine how China and Russia will try to do it just by looking at their leadership. And uh, again, uh, I don't think that's a good thing. I'll let Bill talk more about that, but I, I'm sure you're very aware of uh, of what's going on as far as crimes against humanity in that that regime. And you, you mentioned socialism with Chinese characteristics, like Xi likes to say. I, I would say it's national socialism, Chinese characteristics. It's important to realize the Chinese are not communists. They've got the hammer and sickle, and they they you know they bow to that uh, that marketing campaign. But they're they're actually a fascist regime, and they, they fit very closely to uh, uh, the German or Japanese Empire of the 1930s, which is sadly ironic. Uh, this is the worst mistake the United States ever made. Does anybody uh, recognize who this gentleman is? If you do, pop his name into the chat for me. Give you a second. No prize winner so far. No prize winners. Okay. So this was a Chinese scientist uh, who came to the United States on a scholarship that the U.S. put up in order to repay China for the Boxer Rebellion reparations. The European powers had insisted China pay reparations for the European cost of putting down the Boxer Rebellion in, in China. And the United States received that money, but President Teddy Roosevelt said, we don't, that's not our money, that's the Chinese. And he, he turned it into scholarships to educate Chinese students. Uh, this scientist came to Caltech where he became a leading uh, international rocket scientist. And if you look at that picture on the left, you see him actually explaining how to build a, a suborbital space plane that would fly from the United States to, uh, to Paris in, in 45 minutes. And his design later became uh, well, a project called Project Dinosaur, which later morphed into uh, um, the space. Uh, we, we have a winner. We have, we have a, a winner. winner. <laughs> Nami Goswami, yes, uh, one, one of my colleagues uh, whose work I greatly admire and, and, and strongly recommend her new this book. Insider trading, does it count? <laughs> but anyway, carry on. <laughs> we expect informed people at a, an FPA event, don't we? So, what is also interesting is at the end of World War II, the United States sent this Chinese national to Germany and they made him a United States military officer. He was a Lieutenant Colonel in, in, in the United States military and what was then a segregated military, sent to Germany to recruit rocket scientists, uh, including uh, Von Braun in Operation Paperclip and bring them back to the US. Amazingly, when he applied for citizenship to the United States in 1955, the FBI did a background check, discovered that he had attended one meeting of the Communist Party in Pasadena sometime back in the 1930s. Uh, and uh, locked him up in Terminal Island uh, uh, in Long Beach uh, and then put him under house arrest for many years and then traded him to, against his will to the Chinese government in exchange for five American pilots captured in Korea. Uh, he, of course, went on to found the Chinese space program and the Chinese ICBM program that, that threatens family and I every day. The run comes around. <laughs> Yeah, uh, this was the stupidest thing this country ever did, said Dan Kimball, uh, U.S. Undersecretary in the Navy. Uh, but uh, that's how it got started. Today we have Chinese uh, rocket companies launching commercial rockets, right? You might have seen uh, the, these stories popping up. Uh, here is uh, a, uh, a rocket, the KZ-1, uh, from a company called X-Pace, which sounds kind of like SpaceX backwards, right? And we should be impressed because they dropped the price uh, insanely uh, to $5,000 a kilogram, which is difficult because most US companies in this, this space are needing $25,000 to $40,000 a kilogram to compete. And all of a sudden, the Chinese have cut the price by more, more you know, an order of magnitude, basically. Uh, and that makes it hard uh, to get investment and, uh, in the market. Uh, and it turns out, of course, that's no mistake because 
Guess what? If you look closely, you'll discover that the Chinese commercial rocket is actually the Dongfang 21D uh, ICBM produced in a Chinese uh, state-owned military factory and basically given to these commercial companies for free so that they can go do what? What the Chinese always do in any market is undercut the European and American producers and put them out of business and, and scare off the investors that are funding the development of new technology in the West so that uh, the Chinese can then step up and compete. And they don't mind losing money. Um, and the government is very happy to do that. So you might say SpaceX or Blue Origin is getting a subsidy when the DOD or NASA contracts with them to provide a service or to develop a vehicle. Um, but it's not a case. Of, here's actually the complete rocket. Just go, you know, paint it and, uh, and, and claim that you're a, you're a commercial startup company. Um, they're doing the same thing uh, in a number of categories. They'll be launching uh, constellations of internet satellites and imaging satellites to compete against American efforts like SpaceX's Starlink and, and Planet and Black Sky, who are making uh, imaging satellites, and, and the UK Indian uh, company OneWeb. And you can bet they'll they'll undermine these companies on price because that's what they do. Uh, what's interesting is if you look at this commercial company, uh, which it, the press uh, in the U.S. and in Britain and elsewhere continues to to portray as commercial, and you go look at their website, I love what you actually see uh, under the organization. Uh, in accordance with the approval of the party committee of the higher level, the party branch of Chang Wang Satellite Technology Company has nearly 170 on the job party members, including probationary party members. And the proportion of the party members is 43%, a young and vigorous communist party member team with fighting capacity. Uh, this is your commercial company in China. Uh, so it's really hard to untangle where the connection is between the party, the military, and uh, and commercial space in China. Uh, this was a quote that Elon Musk gave to Wired uh, magazine a while back, and, and I think this says a lot. We essentially have no, no patents in SpaceX. When I started researching the commercial space industry in the 2000s for my PhD dissertation, uh, I went and did a, a patent search and discovered SpaceX had one patent. I'm like, why is that? Well, the answer is because our long-term competition is China. And if we published patents, it would be farcical because the Chinese would use them as a recipe book. So the lack of regard for, for intellectual property on top of the actual theft of intellectual property also makes it hard for Western companies to succeed. Um, they have been undermining the investment community in the West by threatening to underprice the market. But at the same time, they've also been through a repetitious means investing into US space companies and other Western space companies directly uh, and indirectly in order to gain control and access to their, their facilities and materials. They've also been dropping uh, boosters all across China for years. They, they've uh, killed dozens, if not hundreds of people in China by dropping toxic hypergolic rocket stages on them. Uh, and they recently scared the whole world uh, with their new uh, super heavy launch uh, booster, which uh, the first stage ended uh, up in orbit in a who knows where it's going to land mode. And everybody seemed to think this was okay because sometime back in the 70s, the US had dropped a Skylab module on, on Australia. Well, it's not okay. We, we don't allow that anymore. Every uh, US and uh, European rocket that, that flies, we know where it's going to land and we clear the, uh, the airspace and we clear the ocean. Uh, uh, in the area that it's going to go over, and we don't launch these things <laughs> over land or, or populated areas. Uh, the FAA makes sure that you've got a one in a million chance of an interaction between a, a rocket stage and an aircraft or, or a ship at sea, and uh, some people want to increase that to one in a billion. NASA, when they launched the space shuttle, would clear air traffic, for instance, uh, all the way to North Africa and Southern Europe before those launches. Uh, one of the things that's been really interesting to see is that the Chinese have cleverly found out that they're not necessarily welcome inside at least US companies and in many UK companies. <coughs> and there was a company called Global IP that was uh, uh, working with Boeing to develop a satellite and they ended up 
falling under the control of basically the Chinese Communist Party without knowing it through a series of intermediary companies that were introduced to them by investors from Hong Kong and then appeared to be companies from the British Virgin Island and, and banks associated with that company. And all of a sudden they found that six of their nine board uh, members- uh, As I were, told Greg, Greg they, were, they told Boeing they were going to build these satellites and use them to provide internet communications in Africa. That, that was the cover story, as I recall. Indeed, the, the company probably did have that plan, but the company then found out <laughs> that they were controlled by the Chinese and, uh, and Boeing had to, uh, to cut them off, but it ended up being a shocking embarrassment uh, for, and potential security lapse for Boeing, but this is happening all the time. Uh, and it's a, a area of great concern. Uh, I do like to point out that the way we got here had to do with uh, our, our friends on Wall Street and uh, Silicon Valley deciding that if you opened our markets up to China, we would all get rich and that the Chinese would, would liberalize. And they sold us that story for like 30 years. It's interesting to look at this chart on the right where you see the, uh, the net power of autocracies, which is primarily China. Uh, and the net economic power of Western democracies uh, in the inflection point being China's uh, entry uh, or actually the creation of the WTO and then followed by China's, China's entry into the WTO. But we created an environment where basically we, uh, we handed our money over to the, the folks that want to do us in. Uh, and it turned out now they didn't liberalize. We just created a, uh, a stronger, more robust uh, uh, national socialist state. Uh, I do uh, mention NAMI actually, who uh, happened to pop in there uh, and get the answer right on my quiz question. Well done. I highly recommend uh, that you follow her and, and, and check out her articles. But uh, this article of hers uh, recently points out how well the Chinese have done with, with progress. They have executed step by step uh, on a plan going forward in space uh, in a way that has been meticulous and isn't subject to the political changes that the US goes through. Every four to eight years, normally a new administration comes in and reboots what the last administration did in space. Uh, and we have to start over. One of the reasons we, we've not really gotten anywhere since the Apollo program uh, that Ian pointed out. But I'd say NASA is not adrift now, Ian. Uh, the good thing is the Biden administration for the first time in a long time has said, you know what, the Trump space plan for Artemis returning to the moon, the Space Force, these things make sense. The National Space Council that was uh, stood up and they're keeping all of those parts of the program. And I, I, I'm really pleased to see that. In fact, it's probably the only part of, of, uh, of Trump uh, executive orders and, uh, and planning that, uh, that the Biden folks kept with the space plan. But uh, having been part of putting that together, uh, on the transition team back in 2016 uh, makes me really proud to, to see that it stood up and uh, this gives us a fighting chance against uh, our competitors. All right, that's what I had to say, thank you. Well, that was um, a, a chilling but exciting um, run through the houses. Uh, it's, it's not just the Americans, uh, many years ago in Liverpool, which was the home, believe it or not, of the British Interplanetary Society, that Arthur C. Clarke belonged to when he was inventing geosynchronous satellites. Uh, one of the original founders told me they'd gone to the British government uh, with plans for rockets just before, just as World War I, had, World War II had started. And the treasury told them that this was fantasy and they didn't deal with it. I do hope some of those V1s and V2s hit the treasury building afterwards so that they could swallow their, their fantasies in full measure. Dealing with totalitarian regimes is always a difficult problem, especially for fusty bureaucrats who can't believe that other people don't do what they're told. You know, Robert Goodard, who invented the liquid propulsion rocket engine in the United States back in the 20s, actually reached out to the uh, Smithsonian Institute uh, and, and was amazed that he got $10,000 from the U.S. government. Uh, von Braun got the equivalent of about $2 billion in today's dollars from, from the Nazi regime. So, yeah, there, there's an a, a imbalance there. Uh, As they come down, so it's a different department. <laughs> so, Bill, come and tell us about where the Chinese rockets are going up and down. Well, um, my, my involvement in China started as a young UPI correspondent in southern China in 1979. <laughs> Went to the Canton Trade Fair and looked at the things that they were trying to sell to the world, and the Chinese had nothing. The streets of Guangzhou in southern China were dark at night, and they had no neon, no lights. Uh, they were desperately poor. 
So what they've been able to achieve in these decades has been the most astonishing assault on global power that the world has ever witnessed. And in just the recent years, it seems to be accelerating. My, my takeaway from what they've achieved in space recently, they put a, a craft on Mars and they've been able to send back images from the surface of Mars. They've landed on the dark side of the moon. They've had they've put up their own space station, their own space station, had their astronauts uh, walking in the spacewalk. So this represents the core, the core technologies involved in this. We, we know there are semiconductors, computers, and satellites, long-term communications, but it's, it's an astonishing assault on, on the technological leadership that the United States has displayed. To me, this is every bit as stunning as what Sputnik achieved in 1957 and started the American uh, revival and, and John F. Kennedy saying, let's put a man on the moon. So the, the astonishing technological leadership that we've seen demonstrates to me that the Chinese are on par with us now in many technologies. They're still clearly behind in semiconductors, but are working out hard in that. And in some areas, they're ahead of us, so, such as 5G telecommunications, wireless communications. So the, we should be looking at their gains in space here as a real wake-up call, and we should be implementing a, 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 an emergency national program to stem the loss of our technology. It, it appears to me, and I think Greg would agree, that, that the majority of these gains in recent years have been based on uh, American and Western technology. They have created a system where they can watch our laboratories and watch our uh, institutions as they develop new ideas. And then they can exfiltrate those ideas and develop them faster in China because of the billions of dollars that the Chinese government is putting forth. They don't have the problems of having to secure venture capital funding and, and go through multiple rounds of that and have such a high rate of failure. If the Chinese government decides it wants to put money behind the technology, billions of dollars flow in a very, in very short order. And what Rig was describing about what they're doing in our space program is very similar to what they've done in solar and electric vehicles and other, if, if the Chinese state-led model, it is a state-led model, and there's been a fusion of the party and the military and the civilian government, they call it the military civil fusion. If, there, if that model is working so well, it's hard to see how we can stop them in space unless, unless we figure out a way to stop them on earth. And the, the, I advocate in my book, uh, a grand strategy, uh, countering China, taming technology and restoring the media, that we have to uh, create a, a new deal, a new compact between our government and our major technology companies and begin to stop the hemorrhaging that the cyber attacks are causing. Our, our companies and our system is wide open. We're essentially defenseless against the Chinese uh, who have learned how to engage in, uh, they can penetrate our cloud computing systems. They know how to engage in the, the uh, software supply chain attacks. We've seen recently with solar winds, uh, we see in many other uh, sectors. In fact, they created these techniques in China. The golden text was the, the software that every company in China has to download to file their taxes in China. And so you have to, you have to use that. And so, over time, they start downloading malware as they did updates on the software. So the Chinese have penetrated our, our IT systems through, partly through our American companies in China, but also their Ministry of State Security is openly using tools in the United States to look for unidentified or known vulnerabilities in our software system. Then they can place uh, uh, torture horses or shelves in those uh, companies and, and, and get access to them. The other major source of our loss of technology is through human intelligence. And through, uh, the, we, we really need to wake up to the fact that, that we have a, a first class problem in dealing with the presence of, of 360 or 370,000 Chinese students in our most advanced research laboratories. It's only recently that we figured out that many of these students were working for the PLA. They were secretly officers in the PLA, the People's Liberation Army. And so that we've been able to make some headway on that. I would say the vast majority of Chinese students who've come here 
want to get an education, work for an American company, or go back home and work for one of their companies. And that, that's fair game. That's the way the international systems work for decades. What's, what's not uh, part and uh, parcel of anything I would regard as uh, acceptable is that if those Chinese students go to work for American companies, the Chinese Ministry of State Security approaches them, particularly if they have family back in China, and says, work with us to obtain certain technologies. And the, it's, it's clear that they, uh, if the family is, is at risk, the family will be at risk if the Chinese student or the Chinese individual with access to the technology doesn't cooperate. And they can wait decades. They can wait until somebody's in their 40s or 50s before they make that approach. So I, 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 in our pre-calls, I've heard Greg say that we want uh, to prevent the Chinese from getting this group if, and let, let it be us who goes and, and creates the, the colonial structure of space. But I, I, I fail to see how we're getting serious yet about stopping the hemorrhaging of technology that will enable the Chinese and their state-led model to stay run even with us, if not accelerate and not, not defeat us in space. Yeah, those are all oh, good things. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I would like to say you, you, you mentioned setting the structure for the, the settlement of space. We try not to say colonial because uh, that has these negative implications. Although I want to be clear, we're talking about the moon and Mars and there's certainly uh, no indigenous people to, uh, uh, to, to travel there or, or cultures to, uh, to assimilate, uh, which is the beautiful thing about space settlement. Uh, but there is a difference, right? And the reason we're concerned here isn't because we don't want to see Chinese people in space or we don't want to see Russian people in space. Uh, we want to see, you know, everything uh, that the earth has to offer uh, brought forward. This is a chance to bring our full range of, of, of human culture and, and developments and arts and science and, and extend our biosphere uh, into the solar system. But what we shouldn't do is bring poisonous ideologies like communism and fascism to the stars. And if you look at the age of exploration uh, and you think about what happened then, not only did the Chinese make the mistake uh, in the early 15th century of stopping their exploration and in turning inward, uh, which cost them several hundred years of, of competitive development in the world and resulted in the, the, the century of humiliation as they call it. Uh, but the powers that did expand out of Europe and, and, and transferred their cultural and political visions to the world, it makes a difference whether you were settled uh, by the Spanish and received the Inquisition or whether you were, you were uh, settled uh, by, by the British and got the Scottish Enlightenment transferred you eventually. I'm the Gatling gun. Let's, let's, let's get full to you. The <laughs> being a Welshman is not in favor of the British Empire. <laughs> Nonetheless, the things that the British brought from Scotland I agree, Ireland, I agree, I agree. Well, that, made life in the United States a much better place to be, right, um, than life a little farther south. And the fact of the matter is whether it was fair or not, and it wasn't in a lot of ways, in the you know, Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, where the U.S. seized half of uh, the Western continent from, from Mexico and for $5 million, what wasn't fair, but the fact of the matter is people are trying to go across the border from the South to the North because of Not those- the other way around, yes. And economic values that came from Adam Smith and, uh, and the philosophers of, of the Scottish Enlightenment, that was valuable. And so it makes a difference that what we don't wanna do is, is transfer the gulags and laozai from, uh, from Russia and China into space. Uh, we don't wanna see people in concentration camps because of their religion, that's gotta stop. Well, Greg, you when, when we were discussing this earlier, we, we, we were talking about um, the, the, the various state models. But in particular, uh, you mentioned you produced the cover of the book on the high frontier. And I brought it up because I saw there were parallels. The, the high frontier was written and there was people of, of all so people forget that the Star Wars program was essentially an attempt by space enthusiasts to hijack the enthusiasm for the military. <laughs> To get into space on the on, on the back of the Star Wars weaponry, uh, because they couldn't see that we'd be able to persuade the establishment um, to waste so much money as the British Treasury would have seen it. But if you say, "Hey, there's there's commies up there," they they put the money in to get the missiles up. So, to what extent can we can that syndrome be replayed now to make sure 
that the US and the West put commensurate effort into getting into space because it's not so much, uh, you, Bill, you mentioned stopping the Chinese. Isn't it a, a, another way of looking at it in the full spirit of competition is to go further and faster than the Chinese? How do we do that? Competition is good. And I can say from you know having participated in policy conversations, having that threat, uh, particularly if it's an existential threat, is is really really compelling and if you i wrote a book called death by china and that was 10 years ago when i went and knocked on the halls of congress there were a few members of congress who wanted to talk to me about that i was trying to talk about the space threat back then there's a whole chapter in the book on that uh mostly i got that the chinese are our friends we're engaging with them economically it's creating jobs in my district i'm selling them pork or something and uh and uh, we don't want to hear that right now it it's all changed and I, I i rarely meet a member of congress or a member of the administration on either side of the the uh, party lines that if they've had a secure briefing on what's going on uh, that they're uh, in lockstep with with what i wrote in my book 10 years ago they they all get it now so this this is good um bill nelson uh, uh, the mass administrator uh, who was appointed by Joe Biden uh, recently went to Congress and he was asked about the Wolf Amendment, which Frank Wolf put in back 10 years or more ago when the period of time when I wrote my book to stop NASA from having any cooperative agreements with the Chinese because we knew they would steal our, 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 our IP. And Nelson said he hoped to make the Wolf Amendment permanent because clearly he, he sees the same problem that everybody else does. And so it works, you're right on Ian. So, so, Greg, I mean, you in your uh, presentation you outlined how the Chinese are using some of the same techniques we've seen in solar or other detectors. They are driving down the price of uh, sending uh, cargo into space by an exponential basis. Obviously, it's not cost effective. They can't be making money. They are they are taking a loss to do that. They are taking things from the military sector, taking rockets from the military sector and allowing the private sector to commercialize that. We, we don't do those things. I mean, their, their model, their, the state-led model has enormous power. Uh, and I, I'm not hearing from you how you really think they can be stopped. I mean, what, how do you think they can be uh, tempered? How, how, can, how can you get in front of that freight train and stop it? Well, that's an excellent question. But the first thing we've got to do is look at our investment markets. As long as Goldman Sachs and Sand Hill Road uh, and Silicon Valley want to send uh, literally billions of dollars of American capital, as long as uh, our stock exchanges allow Chinese companies to come list on US stock exchanges without being subject to the same accounting oversight rules and, uh, and regulations that, uh, that other Western companies are allowed to. I mean, a European company can't list on the New York Stock Exchange without having its books audited and without having an actual corporate governance structure where the shareholders have something to say. But for some reason, Chinese companies like Didi, uh, you know, the, uh, the company that stole Uber's model, they're allowed to do that. And then guess what? <laughs> the Chinese Communist Party devalues them by 25% overnight by yeah. like their app out of the market so th that's got to stop and the u.s has got us past loss and there's been some movement and some executive orders from both the trump administration and the biden administration to restricting at least companies that are associated with the chinese military from raising capital in the u.s but we've got to be more broad about that uh until china changes the way that it works and you know provides a, a reasonable degree of uh, of corporate oversight and, uh, and participation that's in line with Western norms. And from the audience, Peter Gerritsen wants to know, may, may how do you- so, May I follow through? Yes, One sure. of the sectors I watch is semiconductors and the Chinese buy two to $300 billion a year worth of semiconductors. And, and much of that is designed by Qualcomm, made by TSMC in Taiwan, buy from the Japanese, buy from Taiwanese. So, do you see any evidence that these semiconductors are showing up in the Chinese space program? It seems to me inevitable that they must be showing up. Have you seen any clear corroboration or any clear evidence that yes, these semiconductors are going into the Chinese space program? Uh, I can't prove that, but like you know and I know, um, they're going to utilize whatever technologies they can get a hold of to move their program forward. So until one of their boosters crashes in New York City and we can analyze it, 
Uh, <laughs> we probably, probably don't. Let me look up at the sky. <laughs> we don't know for sure, but I can, I can just tell you that the, the, the folks in San Jose, California, are just eager to connect uh, uh, you know, American uh, grad students and rocket experts with the Chinese and, and, and send the money to go build the thing in China uh, because that's how they do everything. You know, they, they you know, build the iPad there, they build the iPhone there, and heck, you can pollute the, the environment and, and you can beat up the, the workers if they try to unionize. So why would you want to build a rocket in the United States? So it's like the old uh, cartoon of we have met the enemy and, and they are us. That, I mean, the idea that Intel or Qualcomm or NVIDIA would uh, refrain from selling, refrain from selling semiconductors in China, even the most advanced ones, is and that somehow they, they would coordinate with the US government or US intelligence agencies to limit the most advanced technologies, that, that's anathema. I mean, that people, people both in Silicon Valley and in Washington, I suppose, would look at you like you were a madman if you suggested that there would be a conscious effort to restrain the kinds of technologies that are flowing into Chinese military and Chinese space program. Do you agree? Well, th th there we get in, in the words of uh, Comrade Xi, perhaps, the dialectic. How do you reconcile the contradictions between emulating the Chinese state model and keeping an open and democratic model? How do you beat them at their own game without becoming them? As you well, say, how, how do you stop becoming, you know, when, when you become the enemy, is it a victory? Well, we have to maintain, of course, the, our, our, our separate and distinctive differences between the public sector and the private sector, between uh, what the government can do in a cooperative basis versus what it dictates. We, we don't want the government to be putting Communist Party cells in, in Intel or Boeing, but there, this, it seems to me that we, to me, that we need to have a, a greater degree of cooperation, a greater degree of defining that we have a common, common goals. And so far, it's not, it's not been very evident to me that this level of recognition is sunk in in, in, in Washington or still in the Well, that leads into Peter Garretson's question. Uh, how do you measure how serious we are? What is the bar? What are the metrics for saying that the US and the West are taking this problem seriously in in respect of not just stopping, but surpassing the Chinese successes? There's some early signs that the Biden administration is passing $250 billion from technology, $50 billion of which is for semiconductors. They are, they are working with allies in a way that we haven't seen in a while, coordinating with the Japanese and South Koreans. And uh, so there, there are early signs that, that they, they get it. The early signs that they are uh, on the right path, but they're going to have to uh, get uh, much more serious about it and accelerate not just the amount of raw money, but accelerate the, the creation of cybersecurity. We, as I said earlier, we're just wide open. Uh, there's been talk about creating a department of cybersecurity uh, at the cabinet level, which would make a lot of sense. So we, we have a lot of work to do if we're going to mitigate the technological challenge coming from China on Earth, uh, not, not to mention space. Well, some of the questions that are coming in there, I'm going to coalesce them. Um, it's a question of to what extent do we cooperate? We're cooperating. We've got no option. We're hitchhiking a ride on the International Space Station with the Russians so far. To what extent do we want to continue international cooperation, like with the Artemis program, without uh, giving away the store at the same time? And it, yeah. it's a dilemma because we don't want to get... We, the signs of a developing Cold War, which might be a spare to the space race, but we don't want a hot war, which is a bit of a bummer as far as space races go. <laughs> yeah, the first thing I want to point out, a lot of people point to this successful Russian cooperation, right, which, uh, you know, has been good to see. And the astronauts who spend time on the station and the American scientists at NASA who work with their Russian colleagues, it's a, a very good relationship. Uh, and it, it's been successful at the technical level and operational level. Uh, at the political level, it's gotten more and more complex. And this is because the Russians that were in bed with in ISS were not the Russians we signed up with in, in 1995 when, uh, when we made the ISS deal. There's no way that the United States would have made that deal today with the Putin regime that they made with the Boris Yeltsin regime when we assumed that the Soviet Union had collapsed and the Russians were aspiring to join uh, 
you know, the comedy of civilized nations uh, in, in creating a, a new world order that was, that was going to be constructive. So we've continued the relationship because there's a sunk cost and you've got $130 billion uh, uh, investment up there of which $100 billion is American taxpayers. Uh, and as you noted, we did have to do, take rides from the Russians. We don't have to anymore because Elon Musk has solved that problem for us. Thank you very much for a very reasonable amount of money. And Boeing is about to, this month on July 30th, launch their uh, crew capsule uh, for their second test. We, America can take care of that. So we don't, we don't need the Russians. We sure as heck don't need the Chinese. The question is, would there be an advantage in, quote, cooperating with them? In my opinion, unfortunately, you legitimize them by cooperating with them, and you expose yourself to constant technological threat. The other important thing is the Russians actually had space technology, right? Korolev and the Russians and, uh, went and got Germans just like we did, and, uh, and, and they developed their own space technology. And in some cases, their stuff was better than ours, or at least more practical. They stole better scientists. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so it made sense to team with the Russians. The Chinese, at this moment in time, don't have anything to offer us that we don't have. All we do is expose ourselves to, to technology transfer. So I'm not excited about that. And I'm just not excited about, uh, you know, singing Kumbaya with people that have a million people in concentration camps because of their religion are killing them and are selling their organs breaking through a, a military connected uh, uh, hospital system. This, this is crazy. We would even have that conversation. In, in, terms some, of senses, in some senses, we're already seeing the bifurcation of the so-called global economy. We all believed in globalization, that if we had our, our companies, our companies would transfer technology and finance and people and resources across borders. And that wherever that money went, wherever the technology went, as long as shareholders were rewarded each quarter, it, it all, all boats would be lifted by the rising tide. And now we're seeing some stresses and strains develop as the Chinese Crackdown on DD. That's what the crackdown on Ant and DD were very important. The Chinese are demonstrating that they want to be. The Chinese government is demonstrating that they want to be in absolute control of all Chinese entities, all Chinese corporate entities. And you can see that the Biden administration is beginning to put more Chinese entities involved in the military and in Xinjiang on their so-called entities list. So you can see how there is. Uh, there are stresses and strainings building on the whole concept that we can have a, a full and robust engagement with everyone in the world and and it, and we'll all uh, benefit from it. Uh, I, I can't tell you where that's going, but we could be at the, at the beginning of a of a of a uh, unraveling of the globalization theory that we've nursed. I've helped I've helped nurse it, I confess, for decades. We are we're at a very interesting inflection point. Uh, um we are, the, the inflection points are there because we're talking about power now. Now, you know, the, the, I don't know whether you saw it, there was a very good comedy series on the space, on, on the Space Force, <laughs> which showed some of the, you know, pretensions, but at the same time it was there. And uh, I don't know where the Space Force is going, but, uh, and I don't know how it reconciles with the International Treaty on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Uh, it's a bit difficult to pull it all together. So where is that going to go? I mean, sure. most of us don't really like the idea of uh, nukes in space flying above us. It's bad enough having them on the ground with us, yeah. but waiting to drop from the heavens is a bit disturbing for most of us. So yeah, let, let us first of all be clear that we shouldn't be getting our information about the United States Space Force from, from comedians. Uh, it, <laughs> it's incredible. But the fact of the matter is the Space Force is really a reorganization of existing capabilities. The Russians, United States, Chinese, British, and many others, of course, have military assets in space, which are perfectly legal under the Outer Space Treaty. These are observational satellites and uh, communication systems that we depend on uh, to make sure that, uh, that our troops can execute their missions <clears throat> on the ground. Defending those systems uh, is also an appropriate role. The treaty only bans the orbiting of nuclear and weapons of mass destruction. And that is a good part of the treaty that uh, everybody wants to keep and the United States is absolutely committed to. So Space Force simply said, we've got space assets in the army, we've got space assets in the Navy, we've got the Air Force Space Command, and they are all working at different angles and their procurement process is 
suck, frankly. It's hard to, to come up with a better word for it. And guess what? It's a career dead end. If you go into the Space Command in the Air Force or the space part of any of these other branches of service, you never get to the top levels of those organizations. In the Air Force, only fighter pilots get to the top level of, of the Air Force. So it, it's a career dead end, the best and the brightest. Why should they go there, right? So Space Force said, we're going to create a domain so that we have actual space experts in charge of our existing space assets, right? Which I want to point out includes GPS, right? Global Positioning System. You wouldn't have Uber, you wouldn't have Pokemon Go. GPS saves more carbon emissions and other emissions uh, than any other technology that's ever been given to mankind. It makes every form of transportation on Earth about 15% more efficient. Where is my Kyoto credit for that, right? So Space Force is doing a good thing. Uh, it is not uh, uh, orbiting nuclear weapons Ian, or, or threatening anybody. It's simply taking the legitimate role of the military and doing it well. And eventually it's going to have a role in peacekeeping and a role of enforcement of the Outer Space Treaty because the United States is required by that treaty to make sure that any commercial actor or private actor operating under U.S. flag basically uh, follows the rules. And who, who's going to make them follow the rules? Space Force is going to make them follow the rules, right? And we're going to get to that point fairly rapidly where somebody needs to intercede and ensure that the rule of law exists on the moon and in other locations. Greg, I'd like to ask you whether you believe that the dynamism we're seeing coming out of uh, Jeff Bezos and out of uh, our other uh, billionaire playboys, is that, going to, is that energy, is that, is that dynamism gonna be shaped into a government led or government um, monitored program to accelerate our space activities? Or, or, or do you think that they're just uh, playing, playing ego tripping games, massive ego masturbation games? I mean, is that, what are, is, can the government capture that entrepreneurial energy? Well, um, yeah, that, that's a really good question. The, the, the first question uh, uh, about the egos, uh, my colleague, Laura Huang from Harvard and I are writing an editorial for foreign policy on that right now, so look for it. Um, egos are good, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, Thomas Edison and, and Westinghouse and Tesla, go see the movie Current War, a really good example of that. Uh, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, you know, that was ego, right? But it made the world a better place. If that's what it took for these people to put in their incredible genius and passion and effort into making products uh, and services that make our world better, fine. And the government benefits from that. And I'm happy to say the people at NASA right now uh, that I've had the pleasure to work with and people in, in the DOD uh, in organizations like DARPA, uh, and the Defense Innovation Unit, they are remarkably attuned to the value of engaging with commercial innovation and bringing these, not just the billionaires, but hundreds of small startups that, that you don't know about. I had uh, two students I helped mentor at University of Southern California who raised $1.3 billion to 3D print rockets. They get it, right? These companies are getting government contracts. So I think it's good, Bill, but that's a great question. I think we're going to work together. Uh, uh, and have a solution. And, and at this moment in time, we're, we're doing it well. And when do we get to Mars? Well, um, we've got rovers there. The Chinese have rovers there. Uh, and I do want to say we should cooperate with the Chinese on pure exchange of scientific data, right? I don't mean engineering, but scientific data and on space debris management. Mars, uh, in my opinion, humans on Mars 2030 something. So soon? I think so. Uh, Elon Musk is determined. I would not bet against him. Uh, I'm he's, happy to he's see him go to Buzz, but that's another story. <laughs> he's, rarely, he's rarely on time, okay? So don't necessarily buy the dates, but but he's putting together a brilliant program down there in Brownsville, Texas, and he's going to do what it takes to make it happen. He's got vast amounts of his own money and other private capital from serious organizations like Google and Fidelity. Uh, that, that's going to happen. Greg, that was very funny what you said when you were asked recently about the Chinese uh, announced plan to put people on Mars by 2033, you'd say, that's great. I hope Elon is there to welcome them. <laughs> in, in, indeed, yeah. And, you know, well, frankly, they're free Chinese. Uh, um, you know, we, we can all hope that eventually uh, we, we'll, we'll see a change in what's happening there because the ingenuity and the determination of the Chinese people uh, uh, particularly when it comes to commerce and technology is amazing. Uh, it's just it's just a shame how uh, their current leadership is redirecting it into nefarious means. Yeah, I mean, it's whatever you think about it, it is, uh, as as the other chairman said, the, the Chinese people have stood up. I mean, it's uh, they've really put the rest of the world to shame at the way they've turned. 
Uh, I have to, um, we're about to round up, but I want to tell you, we're going to the real high frontier at the next one on the 27th at 11 a.m. We're speaking to people from the Polar Center on the future of the Arctic and the Biden-Putin summit. Because the Arctic and the Antarctic are pretty much like outer space. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's wild and uncharted territory and a potential source of conflict. Uh, after that, August the 5th, we have a continuation of this beyond Earth uh, with Tony Dutor and John Mankins on, uh, the, once again, the commercial exploitation of space. And just as a special, September the 9th, uh, Tom Osborne has written a book uh, on a decade with Peter Jennings. And for those of you who don't remember, Peter Jennings was an anchor person seriously concerned about foreign affairs uh, in the days before Fox and other people who uh, witlessly ramble on. Uh, so th 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 that's what we have coming up. Uh, we hope we'll see you at those. And I'd really like to thank, I think it's been a very stimulating discussion um, fr fr from both of you. And I hope the, uh, the audience out there realize, uh, thought so as well. If any of you have any questions, uh, we'll pass them on uh, or if you can get there and see, um, we'll continue this discussion because, hey, the Foreign Press Association, who knows, we're the future interplanetary press association. Um, we'll accept Martian correspondence as long as they pay their dues <laughs> in dollars. So uh, thank you very much, both of you. Thank you very much, everybody. Uh, you, and let us hope that, um, I don't know, I'll, see, I'll, I'll, I'll get in touch with Richard Branson and see if we can get a press uh, a junket up on his next on his next rocket. Now he's tested it first. Yes. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank see you. you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Bye bye.